Professor Doherty, the new Transport Minister has been announced tonight, Jenny Gilruth. What sort of challenges does he, she face in her entry? Well, I think in the short term, the most important challenge that she and the government are going to have is to get people back onto public transport. So really one of the stories of the pandemic has been the fall in use of both the buses and the trains. It looked like we were having something of a recovery and then Omicron came along. And in the most recent figures I've seen, the number of people using the trains, for example, is still only about half what it was uh, before COVID arrived. It's a little bit better than the buses, but not not too much. So that's obviously costing uh, the government and the taxpayer a lot of money in, in emergency funding. Uh, and she'll want to make sure that we try and attract people back to use those services as quickly as possible. And how does she do that? Well, a, a couple of things. I think there has to be um, a confidence campaign. Um, there's not really been that much evidence of public transport having been a major source of transmission of the virus, which is good news. But frankly, you know, people have got out of the habit of uh, of travelling on the buses and the trains to do the kinds of things that have been closed for a long time during COVID restrictions. So I think we're going to have to see some kind of really coordinated effort uh, attracting people back to public transport involving the government and involving uh, the operators after that. Um, in just a few weeks' time now, we've got the local elections, and I'm sure that the future of the bus networks across the country and the question of whether uh, they should be taken into some form of increased public regulation or even public ownership will be a major issue uh, across Scotland in the May elections. Uh, now, you, were, you worked in the Strategic Transport Projects Review uh, too. Uh, an awful lot of uh, rather eye-catching recommendations uh, on that. Um, how much can Jenny Ruth influence that, or is this, it, I mean, we're talking about projects that might not be completed up until 2045 and such. Can she have much influence on that? Well, you're right, STPR too, like its predecessor, is a 20-year strategic framework for uh, government priorities in transport infrastructure investment. The last uh, STPR we had, of course, uh, brought in major projects uh, like the rail electrification across the Central Belt and also the Queensbury Crossing and and many other infrastructure projects uh, around Scotland. This time, STPR2 is similar. It's a 20 to 25 year strategy. What's perhaps different about this one is that it's changed uh, the emphasis on our priorities and it much more closely matches where government money is going to go um, in terms of which transport modes and services are most beneficial, particularly to the environment and decarbonisation. So a lot of what you see in STPR2, both the really eye-catching things like investment in rapid transit in Aberdeen, Edinburgh and Glasgow, but also um, some more everyday investment in walking and cycling. It's really ambitious plans in there for a uh, long distance walking and cycling routes, actually. That's all about shifting the agenda away from what it's been in the past, uh, which has really been maximising capacity, particularly on the roads, uh, and moving our investment choices to ones which are much more sustainable. Post-COVID, is that investment going to be there? Uh, yes, it, it has to be. Um, there is no uh, way that we can get to net zero without this level of investment, uh, both in active travel and walking and cycling and make it easier uh, for us to do service our everyday needs in our local communities without having to travel as much. But there's also no way we can get there without much greater use of public transport, both the existing bus and train networks, but also these new services, uh, the metro uh, in Glasgow and other rapid transit extensions. Um, in Edinburgh, Aberdeen and better public transport across, uh, across the country. There's also, of course, the issue of decarbonising and making them resilient. Uh, the infrastructure they've already got, that's perhaps not as glamorous as some of the, the big ticket items in STPR2, but decarbonising the railways through electrification, battery trains, for example, and making our roads and bridges uh, safe and sound for the impacts of climate change, we, which we can already see, uh, for example, uh, the rest of the thankful has become um, really quite problematic for people communities in Argyll. The number of times it's now closed because of uh, landslides due to the weather, making a rural uh, and long distance infrastructure more resilient to the uh, to face the impacts of climate change is also really uh, important for the next planning period. You're talking about the light railway in Glasgow. Some people might think of the tram system in Edinburgh and, and raise an eyebrow in terms of the time it took, the cost of it all. Is, it, is this a realistic prospect? Well, we have to get better at these things. There's, there's no doubt about that. We have in Scotland, though, over the last few years, become really quite good at some of our uh, railway infrastructure investments. So the electrification you've seen, not just of the Edinburgh Glasgow Main Line, but increasingly of uh, other other routes across the country, the price of that's been driven down. So you know we are beginning to get better value for money in our infrastructure investment. Of course, one of the ideas behind 
a strategic plan, uh, a long time scale like STPR2 has, is to give the supply chain uh, and those businesses and industries that uh, are there to provide uh, the new routes and, and trains and buses that we'll need to give them certainty about investment plans. And if you're able to do that over the longer term, then we drive down the cost uh, of actually building these things. And of course, that's really important for the taxpayer. But it also means as we get more efficient, we can bring them on stream faster. And we really can't hang about here. And we're all focused on uh, 2045 and our net zero target uh, uh, in 25 years' time. But our milestone targets uh, for 2030 which is reducing the carbon emissions from the transport sector by 75 percent from the 1990 baseline. That's going to be really hard uh, to meet. So we need to get on and start delivering some of these projects uh, really quite fast. Now. Some people will be discouraged by the, the problems of the ferries, uh, the new ferries being built for Scotland and not think that it's at all plausible that we'll actually get a whole new fleet by 2045. Well, again, uh, I don't think uh, anybody in the government would regard their record on uh, procuring ferries is one of the highlights uh, of its performance over recent years. But you know, we're trying to do something which is which is quite innovative here. Of course, these ferries are uh, are not the same as the ones we've built before. They're there um, to service communities for the long term. They're designed to be much lower carbon uh, than the fleet they're replacing. So you know, some of this stuff is is quite difficult. That, of course, is you know. Uh, a recognition that the procurement problem uh, process has had its issues, but you know, government's there to learn from these things, and it needs it needs to make sure it can deliver. And finally, the very ambitious projects about bridges across the islands, uh, particularly in the Hebrides, um, and bridges to Mull. Uh, uh, are these aspirations, or are these real realistic? Well, during the STPR two process, there were something like I think nineteen thousand suggestions uh, for projects overall. There were actually quite a few fixed links to, to other parts of Scotland that were considered as part of that process. And you might have heard of the idea of a tunnel to Orkney, for example. Now, those very large projects were deemed to be unaffordable and not realistic, but the, the fixed links to Mull and some of the inter-island connections in the Western Isles, which have made it into the, to the final document, these are seen to be completely realistic. And when you think about the lifetime of a bridge or a tunnel, you can measure it in more than 100 years. And so over that period, as we've seen in places like Norway and the Faroe Islands, they do begin to make economic sense. So this is about planning for the long term. And I think that level of ambition uh, to serve our rural and island communities is really welcome. Professor Doherty, thanks for joining us in Scotland tonight. Thank you.